okay so hi everyone let's uh, start the lecture and today we will discuss three tasks in this uh, field that are machine translation post editing and uh, quality estimation so the outline of the talk will be like this we will spend some time on the machine translation discussing introduction uh, understanding how a simple smt system can be built then we will briefly touch the neural machine translation and we will discuss the evaluation of mt systems and then we will uh, again quickly discuss the automatic post editing and qe quality estimation which are auxiliary tasks and we will see how we can use them to uh, again improve the mt models that we have so uh, what is machine translation so uh, it is nothing but a translation of some uh, sentence in a source language into another language uh, through use of a computer the applicability of machine translation is widespread uh, we don't have we don't really have to go through it uh, but why do we need it uh, just because we have multiple languages and knowing all languages is not feasible for anyone right and the, uh, the applications are uh, immense as uh, you can uh, think uh, as nlp uh, students why are we interested in this task so the first one is if you pick any multilingual nlp system uh you will find there it's uh, mt involved at some level at least no matter whether it is a bilingual nlp task or multilingual uh, whether it deals with only two or more languages at syntax level semantics level or uh, at least even at the morphological level you will find the involvement of mt in those tasks another reason is that it is a very challenging and old problem so uh, it is as old as computers since then the researchers are trying to solve it we have we have come a long way but we are uh, not where uh, we would like to reach yet so it keeps uh, the challenge alive and uh, this is a task that not just deals with the natural language understanding but also with the natural language generation so analysis and synthesis of uh, language and its generation uh, both of them are part of this task and uh, Uh, again if you read the papers of mt you would see the techniques or theories that have been proposed in the mt papers have been applied to different areas not just in nlp but also in vision the attention mechanism or the transformer is the uh, uh, simple example of it uh, now why is this problem very challenging why is it a difficult problem uh, the one word answer is the ambiguity so we are dealing with the natural language and uh, natural language is anyway ambiguous and now when we try to go from yeah so i was saying uh, ambiguity is the main reason why this problem is difficult so uh, different languages have different properties uh, one example is different word order that's the simple one uh, there are words which are polysemy that means one word can have multiple meanings and even the reverse so synonymy we all know that there could be multiple words uh, they are spelled different their characters in those words are different but uh, they uh, represent the same meaning and also because of the morphological re uh, morphological richness of the languages one example is uh, a word in a marathi language uh, let's say the word is gharacha magsa so this is a single word gharacha magsa that means uh, something that is behind the house so all of this uh, is uh, conveyed just by using the word uh, gharacha magsa now when we deal with such language uh, for translation that uh, makes it much difficult so uh, over the years researchers have tried to deal with this problem in different ways so this is one conceptual model of uh, machine translation that has been followed by the researchers so uh, as you can see we can deal with this problem at different levels the first one is morphological transfer so uh, a example could be simple translation between two languages where there is no uh, need of changing the word order and there is one to one mapping between the between those languages uh, it could be marathi and konkani or uh, hindi and marathi let's say uh, but that is not enough so let's take a look at one example here so here i have one example two sentences in english uh, the first one is he booked a fd in a bank with high interest rate right so here let's focus on two words bank and interest the bank here is a financial entity and interest here is the interest that a person gets on the fd right the second sentence is it is in his interest to reach the bank before the ship arrives now here this interest is something that the person likes and this bank is not the financial entity but the river bank 
Uh, how do we know this? Because of the word sheep. So we will come to that later. But now uh, just uh, think of it. If we just perform the morphological anal analysis and translate this sentence into another language, uh, there is a very high chance that we will uh, miss the correct meaning of these words. And the translation could be faulty. So what we have to do, we have to go one layer above that we have to perform syntactic analysis and then perform the translation. So that is called a syntactic transfer. Uh, but again, is that enough? That uh, uh, that is pretty much enough for, uh, that, 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 I mean, that is necessary when, uh, especially when there is a word order change between the languages, let's say English and Hindi. Uh, one is SVO, one is uh, uh, SOV. Uh, but again, is that enough? Again, let's take one example. I was reading a book and the translation in Marathi is ek, uh, me ek pustak vatsat hotu, right? So uh, just by changing the word order, uh, we cannot guarantee that we will uh, reach this sentence. Uh, sorry, I missed the reason. So uh, here uh, in uh, Marathi, the verb is hotu. Uh, that means uh, we are uh, saying that the uh, pustak is a masculine word just by the syntactic analysis we cannot really capture it so again we have to go one layer up so we have to perform the semantic level analysis and do, then do the transfer and then the generation so uh, that can take care of uh, last sentence but again we have one example where it will fail so here i have uh, here the example is i was watching a movie and i liked it now it doesn't really translate to uh, some particular word based on uh, what we have seen so far and again here the uh, gender of the word with which the word it is associated is important. So for that again we need this semantic understanding. So it will be captured but how to translate it. Now for that we have to again go one layer above and so on and so forth. So there is pragmatic and discourse and at the top is interlingua. So the goal of uh, uh, MT or the, the, uh, the researchers what they tried to did uh, during earlier time was they tried to uh, reach the interlingua level. So if you do this analysis and generate an interlingua representation, which is supposed to be a common representation no matter what the source sentence comes from, then it would be much easier to go to the target language. Right. So that was the goal, but uh, it's not really achieved. So that is a conceptual model. Now let's see how the uh, what have been tried so far. And we will also take a look at some approaches. So the uh, at the start of uh, this machine translation uh, research, the initial approaches were the rule-based or knowledge-based approaches. So the actual linguists sat down, they looked at two languages, their properties, they wrote down rules that if this is a verb, uh, if it is followed by this, then this is how we should transfer in the target language and so on. So they had to write lakhs and lakhs of rules just to uh, translate sentences from one language to another. So uh, that is a rule-based system. The limitations of this approach was, first one is obviously you, first of all, you need the linguist who can actually spend this much amount of time. You have to spend money on it. You have to be patient because someone has to actually sit and write rules and even decide on their order. You have to have the dictionaries because once you have rules, you have to uh, map the words from one language to another. So that was very complex and it was costly in terms of time and uh, uh, money. And also let's say, uh, even if you spend a lot of effort, effort and build one such rule-based system, let's say the data that was considered while uh, developing this system was very formal text. And now we want to use that system for translation of informal text, let's say. Now, uh, since this is a rule-based like, kind of hard-coded system, adapting it quickly to other, other, another type of data becomes very difficult. So again, uh, we had to think something different and therefore they tried other approaches like knowledge-based, example-based and so on. Uh, so these were uh, the early era. Then what started was the data-driven MT as more and more data and compute uh, av became available. Uh, these approaches uh, started uh, becoming famous. So two of them are statistical MT, which started around uh, the start of 2000, uh, like first decade of uh, this century. So uh, what do we need for these uh, data-driven approaches? We need uh, lots and lots of parallel text. Now what a parallel text means? Parallel text uh, means uh, a, a set of tuples. In each tuple, we have source sentence and its corresponding translation in the target language. right? So with this, what we can do, let's see. So now we will start discussing the statistical uh, machine translation. 
सो हाउ सो गोल इन एस एम टी और इन एनी पैराडाइम इज दिस दैट वी आर गिवन अस फॉरन लैंग्वेज सेंटेंस एफ एंड वी हैव टू फाइंड द मोस्ट लाइकली सेंटेंस इन द लैंग्वेज ऑफ अवर इंटरेस्ट इन दिस केस इंग्लिश वी हैव अ फॉरन लैंग्वेज सेंटेंस and we have to find from the whole set of english sentence which sentence it could be the translation of that foreign language sentence so that's finding that is the goal so we use a probabilistic model and how do we model it so uh, the model that we try to build should have this so we would like to have a measure of confidence uh, the confidence of what the confidence that this sentence is translation of this source sentence right and also we would Uh, like to model some uncertainty in this because of the nature of these languages which are natural i mean it's not formal languages right so uh, let's say we have a source language f and target language e then target language sentence is small f and source language sentence is small e then we try to model this probability probability of a sentence in english language given the foreign language sentence and as i said we have to do this kind of search so we try to search over the all possible sentences in english so we take argmax so for whichever sentence the probability is the highest that we select as the translation english translation as e bar so how do we go about uh, uh, doing this so uh, researchers have uh, used this noisy noisy channel model so Uh, what we do here we look at this as a process of uh, recovering the original sentence that means the target sentence from the uh, given corrupted sentence that means the source language sentence so we wanted to model this probability of uh, uh, given a sentence in foreign language we wanted to see uh, which english sentence could be the translation so that means the probability of e given f we use the best rule and we decompose it so now uh, we get probability we have to model this probability of f given e and then uh, probability of e the advantage of doing this is uh, first of all there are mathematical uh, uh, advantages uh, we can represent this in a better way uh, the major advantage is now we have two components the first component probability of f given e could be seen as a translation model so here we will model the translation probabilities so that is supposed to capture the adequacy and the other is probability of uh, english sentence e so uh, that is kind of a language model i think you might have uh, went through language models maybe in parsing or somewhere so uh, that would compute the fluency so uh, okay i just covered it so language model so how likely e be an english sentence so that is a probability to model this we don't really need the parallel corpus we only need the monolingual corpus monolingual corpus means there are no tuples we just have sentences in one language right while the bilingual is parallel corpus for this translation model we need the parallel corpus uh, we will see how why and how we need it now again how do we uh, so okay we know what we have to do but how do we do it again we, how do we compute these probabilities p and uh, the translation uh, probabilities so we use the generating model uh, generative modeling so uh, we generate sentence e using the language model that we have that means probability of e and then we pass this e through the noisy channel that i just talked about and uh, then we get the probability of f given e we compute these probabilities and then we have all this f then we just use this uh, argmax of probability e given right so uh, quickly we will go through this language model i will not spend much time so uh, e is the sentence in english we want to compute the probability of that sentence so first thing is we look at the words in this so the words are e1 e2 up to el l is the sentence i mean number of words in that sentence and then uh, this is how we uh, try to uh, this is how we get the probability so probability of e1 then probability of e2 given e1 and so on so probability of the current word given the previous words right Uh, so that is a simple thing, but uh, computing this is again hard. Therefore, we can use these n-gram language models. So if I say uh, I will compute the, I, I will consider the bigram model. That means for me n is here too. So I will only consider the previous word for computing probability of the current word, right? So this is one example. Let's not really go through it. You can see it. Okay. Now the important is modeling this translation. Uh, the important is uh, modeling this translation probabilities. Okay. 
again just uh, for language model uh, language model we looked at the words here also we have to care about the words we can't just directly model the probabilities of f given e by just looking at the sentences okay so let's say we have now uh, two sentences e and f e is what we saw so there are l words as shown and we also have the foreign sentence where there are m words f1 to fm okay now uh, why this uh, how can we use this parallel corpus for modeling this probabilities right so let's look at this table so here we have some sentences in english and their corresponding hindi sentences the uh, look at the words highlighted in red if i have multiple uh, tuples where there is same word and if i can see the same translation for that same word in the target language then i can get this counts right i can i i can i could be confident that when sitting is there in the english sentence uh, the uh, the word that comes is baitha that therefore baitha could be the translation of sitting so uh, that's why we make use of this uh, parallel corpus but is that just enough is that just looking at these uh, 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 source and target sentences and words, and then getting their corresponding counts, and uh, getting the translation probability is enough. No, why? That is because of the word order, and uh, sorry, not word order. That is because of the word correspondences. So that we call as alignment. So here we have one sentence in English and its corresponding translation, and the lines here represents the alignments. Right. So uh, there is a i mean if we just try if we just go and try to compute these probabilities so uh, it is uh, it is possible that i may get a probability of a uh, prof and rao right but uh, how would i know that that is correct or not so for that this learning these alignments is important so uh, formally here here uh, this is what is alignments so these edges between the english word and uh, target word uh, represent the alignments so mm, so how do we learn it so uh, as i said first we uh, have to look at the words but that was not enough now we also have to care about the alignments so here alignment a is nothing but uh, for a sentence given sentence pair alignment a is a set of all edges that maps uh, source sent sentence words to target sentence words okay uh, again as i said the issue is there could be multiple alignments how would we know that which alignment is correct and which is not so uh, how do we go about it so uh, this is what we can do what we can do is we can uh, count the number of co occurrences for a word in a english sentence and word in a target uh, sentence in this sentence let's say and we divide it by all occurrences of word in the uh, source sentence correct right. so uh, that uh, that would give us this probability if we here is one example so we have two sentences here i want to compute the probability of word proof given the word uh, hindi proof so what i will do i will see how many alignments are there in this uh, between proof and english proof and hindi proof in all sentences that i have here we have two sentences so it would be 2 by 2 and that would be the probability and that which is one then i can certainly say with certainty i can say that uh, proof english word matches to proof hindi word right uh, so uh, now uh for that to uh, know these alignments really what we have to know is these probabilities that we just saw here i had two sentences i computed it there the probability was one so i need to know this word probabilities in order to compute the best alignment right so but uh, how is that possible and uh, again this uh, okay yeah then the uh, for the final uh, task that we have the best alignment would be the one that maximizes this probability of f given e right now so that is uh, yeah so how do we uh, do it so we need to learn the word probabilities for which alignment is required and we need to know the alignment probabilities for which we should know the word probabilities so what we do uh, so we use this expectation maximization algorithm for it it is a two step iterative process where we alternatively try to learn the uh, word probabilities Word, word translation probabilities and and the uh, alignment probabilities right so uh, how how do we do it we first randomly assign the uh, word level translation probabilities to all the mappings and then uh, we start this iterative process first we estimate the alignment probabilities using the randomly assigned word uh, level translation probabilities that we know and then we uh, again reestimate this 
world level probabilities we keep uh, iterating over these two steps until the method converges we are not going to uh, go into the details of the cm that would take a lot of time uh, uh, but finally the model converges and we get both these probabilities which we can use further how we use it we will again see it so we have seen how we uh, compute the pfe just here that uh, when i say reestimate so we actually estimate it we actually estimate the uh, co occurrence of f and d e and uh, co occurrence of e in the data so this is what happens at the end of the process we are likely to get the uh, good alignments between the words and the dark and uh, faint uh, edges represent the confidence that we have uh, between their alignments so you can see bangalore and rao there is a edge but that is not dark so probability of this translation or uh, alignment uh, alignment probability is low uh, just a note uh, so if you just go on uh, like if you uniformly just em algorithm so uh, uh, here we are iterating over two things right first one is uh, we are estimating the probabilities of alignment using the randomly assigned word probabilities word translation probabilities that we have initially and then uh, we we reestimate this word uh, translation probabilities using the alignment probabilities that we computed in the first step yeah so uh, i don't really have it here i can uh, we can discuss it later okay so uh so there are uh, so there are some assumptions or uh, we can uh, do this em stay em process at uh, varying complexity so ibm was the first one that uh, sort of put lot of efforts in it and they came up with different models that uh, assume uh, different uh, distributions for the uh, alignment probabilities and there are like five models if you are interested you can go and uh, read about them so uh, they basically what they do is they, they they start with the simple assumptions and then they uh, model these uh, probabilities and again use them for even uh, uh, getting some even more complex models so so that was about uh, the world level statistical lmt system so uh, what we can do better is instead of considering a simple word as a, a basic unit of uh, processing we can consider the phrases as the basic unit the uh, there are several advantages so first of all uh, just one thing to no note here is here the phrases are not really the phrases uh, which could be linguistically correct that really depends on the co -occur uh, the occurrence of those phrases in the data so here a phrase is nothing but a sequence of words linguistically it may or may not make sense okay so the uh, advantages are this so first one is uh, 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 local uh, local reordering so uh, here is one phrase the prime minister of india the translation in uh, hindi uh, would be bharat ke pradhan mantri now here you can see there is a uh, change in the word order the yeah. sorry the uh, phrase based empty model would be able to capture this uh, much better than the uh, word uh, word uh, word level smt right the next one is that we can uh, we could be better at performing disambiguation uh, so here we have two examples so heads towards pune and other phrases heads towards committee uh, heads the committee the translations are different and as you can see the meaning of head changes depending on the phrase right so if we consider phrases as the unit and if these phrases have been present in the phrase table then there is a better chance that we are able to really model these uh, probabilities for these pairs and uh, also uh, we can uh, learn the expressions and idioms uh, which are not really uh, word to word mapped so here is one example that is hung assembly so if we just go by translating hung and assembly we will not get the trishanku trishanku vidhan sabha really right so that is what we can do with the uh, phrase based empty and another uh, advantage is 
we improve the fluency using the phrase based at smt systems that is because the phrases could be as short as one word but also as long as the entire sentence so as we as our phrases are if we could really map these uh, longer phrases that means the fluency part would improve okay so uh, so here we can see there is it is just a modification of the word level empty uh, word level smt so here also the goal is same that we have to argmax the p of e given f and uh, we had decompose this into translation model and language model uh, here uh, so first part here is the instead of word level probabilities we have now translation level probabilities phi of uh, fi given ei uh what we have to uh, do different here is we have to take care of the uh, uh the positions of these uh, phrases so these models are not really good at word order changes between the sentences so for that there is something called as distortion probability so this is a function that uh, gives us that probability so again i am not going to cover it in this class so that was just to give you a sense of how phrase based smt works and then so we have seen the model but how do we learn these phrases actually right so uh, learning these phrase pairs uh, requires learning the structures that means learning actually the phrases and also their parameters uh, of mapping so uh, we have to learn the phrase table uh and we also have to learn the translation probabilities between the source phrase and the target phrase uh so what is the process here we here also we start with the word alignment that we already saw and uh, we use that to uh see which could be really the phrase pairs which we would like to add to our phrase table so uh, here is one example of it as you can see uh here the phrases shown in the green boxes are the ones which uh, could be the phrase pairs so there are uh, rules how uh, there are some set of rules that we have to follow in order to decide whether the phrase pair is uh, worth adding to phrase table or not the major one is the consistency so the phrases should be consistent as shown in this uh, uh, table in order to add them to the phrase pairs uh, phrase table so uh, let's say we learn the phrase pairs uh, this way and uh, now that we have this phrase table how do we do use it at the time of inference that means at the time of actually generating the translation how do we use this phrase table we have a lot of we have a use table that contains lot and lot of phrase pairs so how do we generate a final translation using that table so we uh, model this problem of generation as a search problem so uh, we look for the best translation in the set of all possible translations the uh, if we just look at the phrase table and the mappings for the one phrase uh, one phrase in source language uh, to phrase in the target languages again there could be multiple mappings then which one do we choose and how do we choose it uh, so this is what we would like to do uh, so here we have one sentence ram met rice with the spoon Uh, i don't want to uh, there, there could be a phrase eight rice let's say just assume that and i would not really uh, like to map that uh, i mean have the translation of eight rice phrase in this translation which may compromise the final translation but i would really like to have the translation of with the spoon phrase at chamach say in the translation at the correct position so how do we do it so doing that is a uh, np complete search problem so there are different ways uh, which we can use so one is uh, uh, this one so what we can do is we can start with the uh, we can start with a empty hypothesis let's say so we ha don't have any phrase there and then we uh, get the partial hypothesis a set of first partial hypothesis which are here ram ne chawal and chamach and then we keep expanding them uh, at each time step and when we do it we also sort of score them Uh, and we decide uh, which partial hypothesis so far is uh, worth uh, maintaining or worth expanding and which one is not so there are different ways to score it again uh, let's say some some scoring mechanism is used and 
then uh, we maintain the we we again have some bound on how many these partial hypotheses we will maintain to get the final translation uh, so we maintain a priority queue and keep adding and removing these based on these scores and finally generate uh, most likely translation so yeah that was a very basic uh, intro to smt so we haven't gone into the details uh, then uh, so this was smt now uh, let's uh, look at neural machine translation so uh, the first question is why nmt what was the drawbacks of smt that we had to go uh, we had to come here or not just smt even the other paradigms which are rule based example based knowledge based uh, so uh, in these approaches we can't really be sure that just because my model can really translate one phrase uh, very nicely uh, it can also translate other phrases uh, with equal accuracy so here is an example just that uh, if the model could translate i go to school correctly doesn't really uh, we can't really be sure that even a similar sentence where the only the ch tense is changed and school is replaced with college would be translated correctly by this system while uh, the nmt systems uh, pose a much more better capability of doing this that is called as generalization so uh, one thing that we have to mind is this that if you look at the earlier paradigms of mt which are rule based and example based uh, there human more human effort was required but uh, data requirement was not much uh, while the, uh, the the it becomes opposite as we move from example based mt to smt to neural mt we have to have huge and huge amount of data uh, but the human expense uh, human effort goes down so nmt requires much more data uh, how nmt models this task of translation is uh, it, it it models as a end to end problem so it is a sequence to sequence problem for neural machine translation so it if you if you look at the architectures that are used to uh, perform this translation we would see uh, there are two components majorly one is encoder and decoder and there is something also called as attention mechanism we will again briefly take a look at it uh, so uh, now we will cover uh, two types of i mean two architectures two encoder decoder architectures where one the rnns are used recurrent neural networks and the the latest ones are the transformer based so here is an example of how a rnn based encoder decoder network look, looks like so uh, so this is a neural network single neural network that we train uh, in one go so here we have rnn cells so uh, at a time we pass one input sentence to it and we try to get the translation at the output so at each time step one unit of this sentence is processed the unit could be at word level or at sub word level or at any level so let's say uh, we are processing it at uh, word level so at time step 1 the first word of the input will be processed by the neural network uh, one component of the neural network which we call as encoder this information will be passed at the next time step where we also encode or process the second word of the input and we keep doing this till uh, we process all words of the input at the end of this uh, process what we get uh, is a single vector that encodes uh, entire sentence information present in the entire sentence so uh, this single representation that represents the meaning of this sentence is then passed to second component of this neural network which is called as decoder decoder again the process goes uh, uh, sequentially at every time step we use this generated representation and generate the final uh, i mean the uh, word uh, output word so as shown here maine kitab padhi uh, when do we stop when we generate the uh, end of sentence special token it is a special token when the decoder generates this token we stop this process so it is a sequential process but there are some uh, problems with this before that uh, let's uh, quickly look at what really the encoder sort of does so if we uh, train a neural network for doing this like we passed input sentence sentences and generated the translations and we trained the network for this task this is something that we would see if we 
plot the uh, representations generated by the encoder so the sentences which are similar in nature you would find them closer to each other in this space uh, yeah so this is the advantage of uh, using an encoder and an encoding all the information of the sentence in a single uh, vector but the problem uh, uh, with this is the quality of the predictions then uh, heavily depend on the generated uh, representation the representation which is generated by the encoder that is much more important uh, for generating the high quality uh, translations if let's say we have a very long input sentence especially in those cases what will happen is since we are taking the output generated by the at, uh, after the final time state uh, it is possible that the, the, the that vector which is finally generated doesn't really contain the information uh, which was present towards the uh, in the initial words of the sentences let's say so we are losing some information uh, if the sentences are long so how do we tackle it so one way to do it could be uh, why do we really have to use the representation generated at the last time step by the encoder to generate the translation what we can do is based on uh, where we are in the decoder uh, decoder that means uh, which word we are translating we could focus on relevant words in the source sentence so uh, here is one example let's say we want to translate word jati then we uh, instead of taking the representation that is generated after the word school we would like to focus more on the word goals which is likely to give a correct translation at this time step for the decoder so how do we do it we use something called as attention mechanism so uh, what is attention mechanism so it simply uh, uses the outputs produced at each time step instead of considering the output produced at the last time step by the encoder we consider we now consider the outputs or uh, hidden representations given at each time step as shown in this figure so we have four words here i read the book and at every time step a uh, time step we have one representation o1 o2 o3 and o4 right so we use these vectors and there are again ways how we can aggregate this information Uh, so one way is to have learnable weights here we have this a11 a12 a13 and a14 uh, which finally we use to get the context vector c that tells us where to focus at what time step okay so uh, these vectors are the vectors which we get after every time step are called annotation vectors and uh, after aggregating this uh, annotation vectors using learnable weights the final vector that we get is called as uh, context vector now how do we use it so simple at uh, time step at each time step a time step we use context vector for that time step as shown here so first uh, uh, during the generation of first word uh, we will use the context vector c1 which will assign different weightages to the hidden states that were given by the rnn encoder then we will pass uh, the hidden output of this decoder at this time step to the next time step along with the different context vector that gives different weightages to words in the source sentence and we will continue it till we get the end of sentence token so that is how the uh, that is how we use the attention mechanism Uh, so that was that 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 is something that uh, was in use till 2018 uh, when the uh, uh, waswani et al uh, came up with the paper on transformer he introduced the transformer the major problem was of uh, these rnns or even if we use lstm or uh, grus the problem there was uh, the sequential processing so it was much slower and uh, even in terms of training uh it was not as efficient as these transformers so uh, what is the change here we will go through this so this is how the transformer looks so again it has two components one is encoder one is decoder again the decoder has multiple uh, sorry uh, again each encoder and these decoders have multiple encoder and decoder blocks as shown in the figure so uh what they have changed from uh Uh, uh what they have changed from these uh, rnn based neural networks so there we processed everything sequentially here we have 
uh, fully connected neural networks. So all neurons in the first layer are connected with all neurons of the second layer, second layer. Uh, now the problem with this is if we just pass our data to it, uh, where word order is very important. I mean the sequence of the words in uh, where, how they are present in the sentence can change the meaning. So if we are just connecting all neurons to all neurons, information from each word will go to each word. Uh, each neuron in the second layer. So what we have to do is we have to inform the network about also the positions of these words. So uh, for that, only the word embedding, that means a single vector representing the word is not really important. We have to embed or add some more information that also tells the network that this is first word, this is second word and so on. So for that, we add some, uh, some another small vector which is called as positional encoding. So there are different functions to uh, embed this information with the word embedding. So one way is to just to use the sinusoidal function uh, and uh, add this uh, positional information to word information as shown here. So uh, now let's look at the uh, next layer in this uh, transfer uh, encoder. So there is a layer called as self attention. What this layer does is it for generating the representation of one word, it focuses on all words in the same sentence. So that's why it is called as self attention. So, uh, so as shown here, so uh, there is an input sentence, uh, input token X, that the word. Uh, then, uh, the, what this self attention mechanism generates is also the encoded representation of this word X, but by focusing on all relevant uh, words in the sentence. So the uh, output size of what the self attention uh, layer generates for this token is also similar, uh, also the same. Uh, so there, there is, so this, uh, this process uh, is done. So using the attention heads. So what we saw as attention mechanism was one attention head. So there could be, so we don't really have to limit ourselves to one attention head. So we can use multiple attention heads. That means for encoding the same word, we can have multiple ways of uh, giving importance to different words in the same sentence uh, and get the better representation for this token. So, so as shown here, there are uh, different heads. We will talk about those that multi-head attention later, and then there are there is one add and normalize layer uh, which adds a residual connection and just uh, adds the layer norm that is for uh, efficiency in training. Uh, and then we have a feed-forward layer again that means fully connected layer, and again one more add and normalize. So what is this multi-head attention? So. Uh, uh, how uh, this is done is uh, inspired by the uh, information retrieval uh, theory. So we have three vectors here, learnable, query, key, and value. Uh, let's say we pass the input x or uh, output of the lower layer to this self-attention layer. Now, uh, what, we, what we would do is we would use these learnable vectors wq, wk, and wv to uh, and uh, multiply uh, the input token with this. And then uh, what we would get is the, uh, so we will get this uh, for each x, we will get this uh, z0, that means the uh, output from each head combined, uh, so, yeah, for this token. And uh, then we take the uh, softmax, of this computation and then we, uh, sorry. Yeah, so we uh, multiply these uh, query and key uh, vectors and then we take the uh, softmax of it that uh, which gives us Z0. Now uh, this Z0 would, would have uh, the information from all heads. Now, how do we, uh, so, so sorry, from one head, uh, likewise, we will get different uh, outputs from each head. And then how do we combine them? Again, we have a learnable vector, WO. Uh, after concatenating these, uh, all the outputs from each head, we uh, uh, multiply that with the W0 to get the final uh, representation. 
so here what is q what is key and what is v so the query q is the uh, uh, representation that we want to generate the key is the each word in the sentence and uh, value are again the uh, values that we get so query and keys are important yeah. so uh, that was the self attention there is another uh, attention mechanism in this transformer which is between the encoder and decoder the one that we talked about was just within encoder block uh, while this is between the encoder and decoder blocks so uh, why uh, what this does is uh, here the query comes from the input that that this layer gets from the previous layer in the decoder while the keys become the uh, words in the source sentence i mean representations of the words in the source sentence which is generated by the final encoder block so, and uh, it's uh, otherwise the working is same so this is also called as cross attention Uh, then uh, the decoder block decoder block is similar uh, the only change was that uh, instead of only self attention layers now we also have the cross attention or encoder decoder attention layer that also focuses on the generated representations of the encoder to generate the translation otherwise uh, the remaining layers are same add and normalize speed forward and again the repetition so this is how the entire transformer looks like we pass the input Uh, which had some embedding then we add the positional embedding to it and then we have uh, repetitions of uh, encoder blocks the output of the final encoder block will be passed to decoder uh, to its uh, uh, cross attention or encoder decoder attention layer uh, and which will then generate the translations again by processing it through multiple decoder blocks so this is a neural network encoder decoder neural neural network that uh, is used for generating translations again at the decoding the methods could be same the beam search the one that we saw the same method could be used here also to generate the translations or we can use greedy or sampling and so on so that was about nmt so now we ha so far we have seen two approaches smt and nmt now uh, let's see let's say we develop this system we train the nmt system we use some decoding method and generate the translations but how would we know that what is the quality of our system or what is the quality of these generate generated translations so there are different ways to do do it the one way is to do it manually so actually get the human annotators or human evaluators who know both the languages and ask them to rate the translations uh, this is much uh, i mean highly useful uh, as this is the goal that why we are developing these empty systems because the final finally who is going to read those translations humans so we are going to consume them so if we ourselves can uh, rate it that would be the best so one way to do it is direct assessment here we ask the human evaluators to focus on two components one is adequacy that means how well the generated translation represents the meaning that was present in the source translation and also the fluency it is possible that the translation is generated it pretty much conveys the same meaning but it is not natural it is not fluent so for that we also care about fluency so it should sound natural to a native speaker of that language so uh, what is usually done is uh, we ask the human evaluators to rate the translations on a scale of 1 to 5 1 means the translation is very poor and five means the translation is the perfect and then we average the scores fluency for fluency and adequacy and say this is the quality of the system the other way to do uh, do this evaluation is computing human effort reduction so if we look at the translation industries uh, they are very much sensitive about the qualities of empty systems so they know that empty systems are not perfect and based on the application they will have to invest uh, less or more efforts into uh, actually making those translations better so this is more practical for translation industry so uh, this is also called as task based evaluation so what they do actually is they use empty systems generate translations ask some post editors to see or verify whether the translations are correct if not identify the errors and correct them 
so that saves their time as opposed to translation or translating the sentences from scratch so this evaluation method or technique or caters to it so here also we do the same we generate the translations using the empty system that we have developed we ask them to actually post edit while they are doing that we uh, record different components like uh, how much time they took how much keystrokes i mean how much uh, uh, typing they uh, they had to do or we can also go ahead and uh, get some more uh, data to assess the quality uh, the there are some drawbacks of using human evaluation the first one needs the bias of evaluators so it is very much possible that for a same translation of the source sentence one evaluator gives a score for, score of 3 for adequacy while the other gives a score of 2 so how do we trust them so then for that we have to use multiple annotators and then compute the inter annotator agreement and then see whether we can trust them or not and it takes a lot of time uh, also it is time consuming obviously because someone is going to sit and verify and also it is going to cost money especially when we are in a development where we would like to uh, quickly know how good our empty system is in order to improve it uh, this is not the method that we would really like to go for so uh, we go for automatic uh, metrics so the uh, one is uh, translation edit rate it is kind of similar to uh, her human effort reduction uh, this metric uh, requires a reference translation so the two metrics that we saw did not really need a reference translation because that is a human who can judge the quality or who can know that what would be the correct translation of this source sentence now here we would need a reference translation uh which is of, of gold quality for given source sentence so what this translation error uh, edit rate uh, this metric does is it measures the number of edit operations that are required for reaching the reference translations from uh, translation from the uh, given uh, predicted or generated uh, translation which is error mass so the these edit operations could be insertion deletion substitution and uh, shifting so this sort of gives us idea like how much effort the post editors would have to put uh, in order to reach the uh, gold translation so this is just one thing to note this is error based metric the more edits required to reach the reference that means uh, poorer is the quality of the translation the uh, widely used or primary metric in the field of machine translation while is blue so this also uh, like tr this also requires uh, reference translation so it is a similarity based metric that sees how similar the translation and reference sentences are so this is a precision oriented matrix uh, that means we try to see uh, uh, out of all words that have been generated in a translation how many of them are how many of them match with the words in the reference translation and it's not the other way around so it is a precision oriented uh, metric and we perform the n gram based matching so it is a similarity based uh, metric so we will now uh, spend some time on this so uh, let's say uh, we want to match the n grams to have an idea about how good a translation is so let's call our translation which is produced by empty system as a candidate translation and uh, the gold translation which uh, let's say has been generated by a human is called as reference so here we have one example the reference sentence is he goes to the library whenever he can and the candidate is he goes to the new library whenever he can so one extra word has been added by empty now how do we assess the quality of this sentence so what do we do we get the uh, n gram scores so uh, first one is unigram score we see uh, how many words from the candidate are present in the reference so if we just try to count uh, here the unigram matching like whether he is present in reference yes so one whether goes is present yes one so like if we count uh, here you will see all words from the candidate except new are present in the reference so therefore the count is eight and we divide it by the total number of uh, words in the candidate that is nine because this is a precision oriented right so here the p1 or a, a one gram score will be 8 by 
uh, we extend this. We go at bigrams. So here we try to match the bigrams uh, between candidate and reference. First, we would see whether he goes is present in reference or not. Then we would see whether goes to is present in reference or not, and so on. And likewise, we have four counts here, eight by nine, six by nine. And then how do we combine? So we have similarity till uh, quad grams, four four grams. Then how would we combine them? So we simply take the geometric mean of these scores. So that's the final score that we get. That is a blue score. But what is the problem here? Uh, that we would see the problem is if the generated translation is short, and if that uh, most of the uh, units of that translation are present in the reference, then then also we will end up getting a high score because it is a precision oriented metric. So here is one example. Let's say the candidate only contains he goes to. Okay. Now let's try to uh, get the counts for one gram, two gram, three gram, and four gram. They are going to be one for each of them. So the final score that we are going to end up with is one. That means it says the translation is perfect, but in reality it is not. Now how do we solve it? So uh, what we do is we care about the length of the translation now. So if the translation is much shorter than the original reference translation, then we penalize it. So it's very simple. So uh, this is the uh, brevity penalty. It is called as brevity penalty. Uh, it is we use this function. So if the length is shorter, uh, then we use this e to the power one minus r by c to penalize the geometric mean. Uh, and if uh, the length of this generated translation or candidate is more than reference, then we don't have really have to care about it. So we don't penalize. That means we uh, keep it as one. So simply as uh, the blue score now becomes the uh, multiplication of these four scores and also the brevity penalty and the geometric mean again, obviously. So uh, now if you compute this brevity penalty for the same example that we have gone through, uh, the penalty will be 0 0.37. So the uh, fourth order square root of 0 0.37 would be the final blue score instead of one. So that is how we have solved it. But there are some more problems. So the second problem is, what if we are comparing our candidate with multiple uh, reference translations? Uh, the first, uh, OK, before that, why, why, why do we have multiple reference translations? We got, because it is very much possible that one sentence has multiple correct translations in other languages, OK, uh, in other language. So, uh, it is a usual practice that usually even the test sets that we use for uh, evaluating our empty systems have three reference translations for the same source sentence. So here we have an example. He watched a movie and he watched a film. And the candidate is, again, let's say the empty was not written properly. And it has hallucinated. It has uh, generated he, he. OK. Now, uh, if we go uh, the usual way and we try to get the unigram count here, what we would do is we would see, OK, he is here. How many times he is present? He is present two times. And uh, the total number of words and candidate are two, so p1 will be one. Okay, but that's not what we would really uh, want, right? So uh, the solution to address this problem is clipping. So instead of uh, just going on and counting the occurrence of that word in all reference uh, sentences uh, and simply adding them, what we do is we care about the maximum uh, times. Uh, in any reference, for any reference sentence, maximum times, uh, uh, how may, uh, so what is the maximum count for this n-gram to occur in any uh, reference sentence? So now if we again try to count it this way, then it will be one because in any reference, he is present only once, right? Therefore, uh, the clip count now will be one by two. So that's something that we will have to add. But uh, so, so we have solved it. Another problem with this, uh, so far is we can, even even with all this, we can uh, end up with a zero blue score. Why? Uh, what we are doing is we are simply multiplying the n-gram scores, one gram, two gram, three gram, four gram. And then we're, uh, yeah, we, we are mu multiplying it, right? So if any of them is zero, uh, no matter how the translation is, we are going to end up with a zero blue score. 
so here we have one example he watched that movie 100 time and he, uh, the candidate is is he watched that film the 100 time the adequacy here is fine right even the fluency is fine i would say uh still this sentence will end up with a zero blue score uh, because there is no four gram match if you try to match any four gram uh, you will not find it in the reference because of the word film uh, and movie mismatch and they are at the same position right so how do we do now how do we assess the quality of mt system if this is the problem that we are going to run into so a very simple solution to tackle this is instead of really caring about the uh, blue scores of each source and translation i mean each translation we care about the uh, blue score over the set of translations let's test corpus okay so what do we do is we aggregate the 1 gram count 2 gram 3 gram and 4 gram counts for all the translations in the test sentence and only then perform the uh, geometric mean so even though if uh, some of the uh, n grams for some sentences is zero we will not end up with the uh, uh, zero blue score so this is the summary so this just shows how we would Uh, go from sentence level blue to corpus level blue so it's the same the count matched here the clip clip count so we iterate over each n gram for all sentences and uh, get the precisions and then uh, use the computer blue score uh, just one question one question here to think about it uh, whether we will be able to capture the uh, semantic similarity or dissimilarity using the blue scores so spend some time and you will have a better idea about it so that was about mt evaluation so we looked at two metrics or uh, two types of metrics manual and human uh, sorry manual and automatic now we will uh, move on to automatic post editing and quality estimation so uh, why automatic post editing or even why first of all why post editing as i said the mt systems are not perfect even the ones which are trained using transformer using huge amount of parallel corpus are not perfect we cannot really blindly consume that translation so we have to verify that and correct it before consuming it so uh, that is what is done in translation industry or even anywhere where whoever wants to consume so they sit they validate the translations and edit that means they correct the errors in the translations uh during this process we end up creating this data set right so we have a source sentence we have the translation which we obtained from a mt system and now we have the corrected version of it now uh, so what we try to do now is why can't we just use that data and try to correct some systematic or repetitive errors in the translation automatically in order to again reduce the human effort so uh this is especially also useful in the black box scenario let's say uh, you have you have gone to google you are using their google translate api and you have translated loads of documents and now there are some errors which you uh, corrected but uh, does this uh, help you in future no because the uh, mt system itself the google trans google's mt system was not accessible to you you know what errors are there in the output generated by google mt system but you can't do anything about it because they are, because the system is system itself is not accessible so in such cases what you can do is you can have this post edited small amount of data and you can have a system that is good at trans, uh, good at correcting errors of the google mt system so that is why we uh, care about this ap here is, so now uh, for machine translation the input was sentence in a source language and the output was the its translation in the target language here there is going to be a slight change and that is this the input going to be a source sentence and also its translation generated through some empty system in the target language so this concatenation of these two sequences is going to be passed to the uh, whatever system or model that we have for performing this post editing automatically and then in the output what we are expecting is we are expecting the uh, a version of translation that doesn't contains errors or it at least doesn't contains repetitive and systematic errors so here is one example that the source sentence here is people can get covid-19 even after vaccination uh, 
द ट्रान्सलेशन इज लसीकरणानंतर ही लोकांना कोविड नाईन्टीन मिळू शकतो नाऊ द ट्रान्सलेशन मिळू ऑफ द वर्ड गेट इन मराठी इज नॉट अप्रोप्रिएट गिवन दिस कॉन्टेक्स्ट इट इज नॉट दॅट इट इज रॉंग बट फॉर दिस कॉन्टेक्स्ट देर कुड हॅव इन अ बेटर लेक्सिबल चॉईस सो दिस इज वेअर वी कॅन एक्सपेक्ट अ ए पी सिस्टीम टू करेक्ट इट दॅट मीन्स सो हिअर यू कॅन से ओनली दॅट वर्ड हॅज बीन चेंज बाय द ए पी सिस्टीम फ्रॉम मिळू टू हू फॉर दिस कॉन्टेक्स्ट दिस सेंटेन्स इट इज अ बेटर वर्ड now there are some things that some uh, one important thing that we have to keep in mind while developing this system is uh, that the system should only make the necessary changes to translation and it should not change the translation a lot so that is called as minimal editing and this is something that uh, hasn't been really followed so so far the whatever research is going on whatever approaches are coming up they struggle uh, Uh, they struggle with following this approach so what happens is we end up changing the translation much more than needed in some cases even reducing the quality of the translation so which is definitely not desirable so that is called as oh, uh, the problem of over correction so uh, here the data that we have is as i said we have a source sentence then the translation generated from mt system and also uh the human posted as a reference we have the human post edited version of this translation so each tuple now contains these three sequences instead of two as in the case of uh machine translation parallel corpus sorry now obtaining this data is expensive we cannot really expect someone to sit and translate crores of sentences i mean post edit crores of sentences and have that data to develop ap systems so what we do then is we artificially generate these triplets so one very simple way that is followed is we start with the empty parallel corpus which is in abundance where we have a source sentence and the reference translation and what we do we use some empty system or we train a new empty system and we translate these source sentences using that system and then we get this empty that means the translation now we use the reference sentence from machine translation as the post editing uh, reference sentence so uh, as shown here so uh, we worked with the english marathi ap uh, at the data, the data that was available for us was this so we had 25 lakh triplets generated artificially in this way we had some real data as well where actually human sat and corrected the translations so that was uh, 16k triplets and for validation and testing we had 1k triplets each so now how do we train the this api system we again use this transformer network instead of using a single encoder and single decoder we used two encoders to encode english sentence and the marathi translation the reason why we used different encoders is because the english and marathi these languages are distant languages uh, their script is different also there is very less vocabulary overlap so therefore we wanted to encode them in a better way so we have two encoders here now what we do is the outputs or representations of source sentence and translation which are generated by these two separate encoders are passed to two different cross attention or encoder at encoder decoder attention layers in the decoder as you can see the sequence here is this that first we pass the generated translation which is errorness so the decoder now uh, has the information that the errorness sequence is there and then we pass the source sentence which is supposed to be error free so this allows the decoder to really uh, look at what are the errors in the translation and how uh, it can correct it so that's why this is the sequence and uh, the one way could train one way to train this network could have been just passing all the i mean training it end to end in a single step just pass just concatenate the synthetic and real api data that we have and then translate it but the problem here would be if we look at the uh, translations and references in the synthetic data they are not going to be the minimally edited versions of each other right so, but uh, we want our empty system to perform the minimal editing 
so uh, that's not a really good idea so then the one way could be first train your model using the synthetic data and then fine tune that model i mean train it further again only using the high quality real api data of 16 gate triplets that we had so that could be one way to do it uh, what we did was uh, we cared about some more things here so uh, i had discussed how we generated this synthetic data so we had used some empty system so now there is a depending on the quality of the empty system the quality of triplets is going to be vary so what we did first is we identified the triplets in our synthetic data which are of high quality and low quality so how did how, how did we do it we computed the translation edit rate scores between uh, translations and the uh, uh, references in those triplets also we divided our synthetic corpus uh, in into different domains uh, why i will talk about it so that was one uh, now Uh, so here we go, let's say we, go, we we know or we are aware that the quality of synthetic data is not good and so there are going to be triplets which are of low quality but it is very much possible that not all components or all uh, units of those uh, sequences in the triplets are of bad quality it is possible that some phrases are translated correctly we would like to uh, include those phrases instead of just giving away with all that low quality data so what do we do there is we train the smt system between the source sentences and the translation generated we train another smt system between the source sentences and the references in the synthetic data now uh, when we train the smt systems that means we are also getting the uh, phrase tables now we match the phrase uh, phrase pairs in these two tables uh, considering the source phrases as keys and we form phrase level triplets so we end up get, uh, end up with the additional data and again uh, even here again it is possible that not all the phrases that we have got through this way are going to be of high quality so again we use the lbsc scoring to filter them out so lbsc what it does is it is a bulk based embedding but model based embedding it uh, so we get embeddings using bot for both the phrases or sentences and then we compute the similarity between them cosine similarity and we decide on a threshold and we uh, then based on that we decide the quality uh, now uh, for training this system now we have a data which is of better quality now how do we train the model we uh, follow a, a sophisticated training process which is popularly known as curriculum training strategy where we train the model gradually on a complex set of tasks so uh, the step one that we did was we first trained this model without one encoder so we have two encoders now there was no empty encoder during first step so we trained the source encoder and the decoder uh, on a empty task so the model should first know what is the translation task so first we trained it for translation then in the next step we added this uh, another encoder and then we we trained this new model on the Uh, for performing automatic post editing using the synthetic data where the tr between the translations and references was high this is to have more feature diversity in the model so model should learn uh, what could be the errors and what are all kind of corrections but the problem at this stage would be the model after uh, model that we get after training at this stage is going is not going to follow the minimal of uh, the principle of minimal editing because the tr here was high there are so many uh, errors so model has to correct a lot so even at the time of inference it is going to perform lots of corrections so uh, now we have to control it so then what we do we use the remaining set of data where the tr was low and we further train this model so here the model learns to not perform many corrections to the translation here uh, here also uh, i mean uh, just after this step uh, as i said i had the data which was separated uh, into uh, domains so now we utilize that and we also use the external empty candidates that means what what I, what we do is we train different empty systems again and we translate the same sentences again and we get multiple translations we can simply concatenate those multiple translations and pass it to the empty encoder again it uh, allows the model to learn much more 
error matrix. So source sentence is same, reference is same, translations are different. So what we do uh, then here is we uh, in the in this step again we train these external empty candidates which are from the domain of interest. I mean the these sentences should be from the domain in which the sentence is from the uh, validation uh, set false. We use that and train the system. In the final step, we only use the real AP data that really follows the principle of minimal editing, which is obviously in domain data, and train the model. So in five steps, we train this model. Uh, even after doing all of this, we observed that the model still ends up performing unnecessary corrections or edit edits. So what we did was we used a sentence level quality estimation system that sort of gives you tells you the quality of the translation that you have got. We will discuss it quickly. So we use that quality estimation system to decide whether the output generated by this API system is worth considering or not. So uh, we don't have much time. Uh, so here are some results in terms of TER. So there are some standard test sets. So there is something called as workshop on machine translation. It is a track in EMNLP where they uh, each year this sort of uh, run the competitions where they also provide some data and also hidden test sets. So on their test sets, so these are the results. So here the first line that is do nothing baseline. Uh, that means we are not touching the translations. So we consider the output generated by empty system as the final outputs. So here the TER is, as you can see on the uh, WMT AP va uh, validation set is 22.93. And after sort of performing all these experiments using curriculum training strategy, uh, initializing the encoders with uh, other pre-trained models like IntigBert and so on, uh, we were finally able to reach the TR of TER score of 19.01. So that's sort of uh, four point in, in, uh, improvement. And this was the result on the test set. So uh, we were the uh, top system or top submission for this com competition. So where we were able to improve the tier on the test set from 20 to 60.79. So here are some qualitative observations. So what kind of errors the our API system corrected, where it failed. So one interesting thing here is, so first one, first example shows how the uh, translation of word underprivileged and contributed uh, contribute to is modified by AP. So this is a sort of example of uh, a better lexical choice. Uh, then uh, this is one more example where the translation of, uh, produced by MT had missed the negation that opposes or uh, negates the meaning of the translation. But AP was able to capture it and add that negation. Uh, then there were uh, still we found some uh, uh, poor performance as well. So uh, again, the first one shows the overcorrection problem. The AP system shouldn't have modified the translation really here, but it has done it. And same is for in the uh, last case. So uh, that was about QE. Uh, then coming to quality estimation. So we uh, looked at uh, manual and automatic uh, evaluations for about automatic evaluation metrics. The one thing that was there was we needed to have a reference translation. Uh, that is a sort of limitation of those approaches. If we don't have a reference translation, how would we know? Let's say an empty system has been trained and now we are using it uh, in production. Let's say we are translating it every day to translate the documents. Uh, there, how would we know what is the quality? Because we are using we are translating new data every day. We can't have the reference sentence for it. So. Uh, what we can do is we can again have a neural system that predicts the quality of these generated translations without looking at the reference translation. So this is again uh, another task in the field of machine translation, uh, which doesn't require reference sentence. It can be performed at different levels. Popular are the word level and sentence level. At word level, we can train a model and get whether each word in the source and target, or let's say each word in the target whether it is a correct translation of some word in the source sentence or not. If it is correct translation, the tag would tag for that word would be predicted as okay, otherwise bad. At the sentence level, it gives a score that denotes the quality of the translation. So we can say, uh, we can train a model uh, to perform the uh, direct assessment that was in the manual evaluation. 
so here we have an example uh, the english sentence is sentence is he ate two apples and the translation is usne do seb khaye what we do here is just to uh, not uh, miss on the case if some missing words are there i mean trans uh, the empty system has missed some trans uh, translation uh, has missed translating some words uh, to cater to that case what we do is we add the gap tags between the uh, translation tokens so that's why we have a gap tag here and this is what we can expect from a qe system the sentence level qe system for this translation has given the score of 0 to 9 and it is between 0 to 1 that means suggesting that this is a very high quality translation and also if you see the output of word level qe all tags are okay that means all words in the translation including the gaps are okay gap is okay means there are no missing words at that position now if you pass this sentence instead to the qe system that he ate two apples but the translation is usne seb khaye now the word do was do is missing here the sentence level qe score drops to 0.4 so from 0.99 there is a drop to 0.4 suggesting that the quality is poor and also at the this position of gap uh, you would find the uh, at at the position of word two in the source sentence the tag is bad that denoting that this word hasn't been translated or it hasn't been translated correctly and uh, at the gap also uh, there is a bad that means suggesting there should have been one or more tokens at this position so uh, usually what happens is researchers try to um, have these two models separately they train the sentence level and word level model separately but they run into a problem that uh, what we have observed is let's say we pass the same source sentence and translation the word level model tags all uh, tags as okay saying that there are no errors but the sentence level model uh, gives a very poor score let's say 0.4 so there is this uh, inconsistency in the output even when the uh, uh, input is same to these two different models so in our work what we had tried to use was we tried to use the multitask learning where we sort of combine these two tasks and train us jointly train a single model that uh, uh, overcomes this problem so this was a simple excel xlmr network we concatenated source sentence and target and we jointly trained it using one uh, advanced mtl approach that is nash mtl which uh, which uh, cares about the uh, conflicts between the gradients of each task and make the uh, informed updations so uh, i will skip this in interest of time so here is the result that we have so this table here shows the uh, pearson and ps pearman correlation between uh, the uh, sentence uh, so the, the, the correlation here is computed between the uh, ds scores predicted by the uh, sentence level qe model and uh, uh, the bad tag counts from the uh, word level uh, output layer so here the negative correlation uh, shows the Uh, predictions are more consistent and as you can see the uh, second column here has uh, improved it consistently for all these language pairs suggesting that uh, jointly training two models for these two tasks helps each other here is some uh, qualitative analysis and so this was it so quickly how we can use this to uh, improve the nmt so there are different types of corpora uh, there could be a high quality corpora poor quality corpora so the uh, if the parallel corpus is not of good quality it is not really a translation translation uh, of each other then it is called a pseudo parallel corpus as shown here uh, what we ideally want parallel corpus to train our empty system but we can also deal with the comparable but pseudo uh, dealing with the pseudo parallel corpus is much difficult or even even if we are we are using the comparable corpus we would like to extract the high quality sentence pairs in this data there are different types of noises that are present in the uh, pseudo parallel corpus uh, which we would like to deal with Uh, so there are different techniques about dealing with such data one is phrase pair injection i talked about phrase pair injection how we augmented the api data using phrase pairs here also we do that even for mt the other technique is using that lbsc so we get the embeddings of source and target using some model and uh, filter out this data and also 
as uh, in case of quality uh, automatic post editing we use a sentence level quality estimation model to decide the quality of the pairs source sentence and the uh, translation or corrected translation the last uh, method that we tried was ap then qv so what we did here was instead of training the empty system first the we used the pseudo parallel corpus we had the api system we instead of post editing the data we pre edited the data so we had a poor quality parallel corpus we passed those uh, source sentences and target to ap and the output generated by ap were then further uh, checked with the qv for their quality and if the quality is good uh, i mean obviously we would expect the ap to improve the quality of pseudo parallel corpus then we use this data to perform the experiments so these are some data statistics how much parallel corpus we had and here are some combinations and different methods so baseline is the uh, normal empty system that we had and these are the blue scores for all these language pairs so you can see for english marathi let's say the baseline blue score is at 0.88 and if we pre edit the pseudo parallel corpus uh, using this ap then qv approach and train the empty system with that data the blue score jumps to 14.44 similarly even for the opposite direction you can see there was a high jump because of unavailability of data for other language pairs we don't have results for this ap then qv just filtering for other language pairs so uh, yeah this was it so we have introduced ourselves to the problem of empty in this class we briefly discussed the smt and nmt uh, we have sort of spent some time on the blue score we saw what are the problems with it and how to tackle them and what is the limitation of it and then we saw the ap and qv and how we can use them to again improve the empty yeah thank you